Okay, that was the sign of life. I can now start. All right, I'm going to talk about SIMD programming and just a little bit of, a, of affinity. Um, so, um, would be great if it would work. Um, legal disclaimer, you know that already. Um, you've seen that before. Let's skip it. Okay, so, you know, this is now kind of a mixed presentation between me being an Intel employee doing software enabling for Intel and also my second hat um, being an OpenMP language committee member working on all those new features, okay? So if I get a little bit excited, um, you, know, you know, stop me. Um, all right, um, so this is now, because SIMD parallelism is something really new to, to OpenMP, I wanted to give a first heads up on what OpenMP actually supports nowadays. Um, so the, the one thing that we really don't support, that's cluster parallelism. That's the domain of, you know, PGAS languages, of MPI, and all those programming languages and, and programming models, and we don't want to cope with that. You know, probably from the past that Intel had cluster OpenMP, which was a rather unsuccessful product, and so, you know, OpenMP will never try to be in that, in that space um, as a language. We leave that to the ones that, that really know what to do there. Um, but since OpenMP4, we support accelerators or coprocessors. So we are now in this domain of heterogeneous programming, and that's now tagged as green. And of course, we also support node parallelism, socket parallelism, and uh, parallelism on the cores. So, you know, that's the traditional multi-threading uh, shared memory programming domain. And then in yellow, I added something like SuperScalar and Pipeline, um, which basically means OpenMP makes use of it if it's in the hardware, but there's no particular feature that would enable you to express something SuperScalar in your, in your code. It's just, you know, if it's there, we use it. If it's not, uh, we don't use it. And then with OpenMP4, we also added um, support for SIMD programming. And I kind of brainwashed myself to talk about vectors, um, which is not exactly true. Whoever programmed on a vector machine like an NEC knows that vector computers are different than SIMD computers, right? So anytime I say vector, please substitute SIMD instead, okay? All right, and this is not working again, great. Okay, so SIMD programming. Now, you know, that's kind of a marketing slide. Um, so that shows you the evolution of SIMD width over the last uh, probably decade. You know, SSE, that size, then AVX2 or AVX, we doubled the size. And guess what, with AVX512 on the many integrated core architecture, so CM5, we doubled it again. Um, and it nicely shows that the vector is actually twice as long when you double it. Wow, interesting. Okay, now, the problem with SIMD programming is that over time those SIMD units became more powerful, not only in the sense that they had longer vectors to compute on, but also the capability, so the expressiveness, what you can do with those vectors um, was, was more and more. So, you know, this is easy. Right? You got a vector or a SIMD lane, and you add them element-wise, and you produce an output vector register. Right? That's easy. That's something a compiler can usually handle, unless you restrict you know, the, perform uh, the floating point model to a certain very restricted set of, of floating point operations. Right? But that's something a compiler could usually do. What about this? It's used multiply add. So now you take you know, two operands, you multiply them, you add a third operand, and you call that your output. Will the compiler do that? No. Why? It changes accuracy, right? So if you, if you don't do fused multiply add, what you do is you load a 64-bit precision number, you multiply it with infinite precision in the machine, or simulated infinite precision, and then you truncate it to 64-bit again, writing it back to the vector register. Then you load another 64-bit var variable. You again do a um, infinite precision addition, and then you write it back again, or truncate to 64-bit. Here, you do multiply and addition with infinite precision, and that changes the result, usually. 
right? So if, unless you, res, uh, you relieve the compiler from sticking to the precise floating point models, um, the compiler will not do such an instruction in your code, usually. Right? If you look at the, our manual, you will see if you do floating point model precise, it imp automatically implies no FMA, right? Okay, so that's an, another compiler option that you would have to add. All right, and then we have those mask registers. So that's another level of complexity for the, for the compiler to figure out if an if statement should actually be done in a vectorized way. So you can compare a whole range of if statements in one go, you produce a mask register, and then you only work on those elements where the mask register is actually set to true, okay? Yet another level of complexity. And then to make it worse, there are swizzles, blends, shuffles, and whatnot. So you can on, not only load st unit stride data, but you can also arrange the data so that you know, it has a different format after it has been loaded or during the operation, depending on the instruction set. And this is now really hard for a compiler to figure out. Uh, there was one guy yesterday asking for complex numbers. Yes, you were there. Um, so, you know, for such simple things, the compiler potentially can figure it out, but if it's, you know, an arbitrary data structure, the compiler is essentially lost. Okay? Um, now, compiler auto vectorization. That's kind of the holy grail that everybody wants, right? I want to change my make file and tell the compiler, do the mag magic thing for me, and I don't care about performance anymore, unless, uh, um, and you, you'll give it to me. Um, so the problem here is that, of course, the, the, um, the increased complexity of those instructions make it a lot harder for the compiler um, to do its job, right? And uh, we invested like, a, a, I don't know how many thousand man years of compiler engineers um, to get our compiler to where it is now. So it's really a hard job for the compiler to figure out um, if to vectorize and how to vectorize. Now the problem is, and I'm a, I'm a computer scientist, so I, I should, by training, be able to prove that a compiler cannot understand the code you're writing. Right? There's the um, uh, Rice's theorem and the halting problem and all those you know, nice theoretical uh, building blocks in computer science that basically tell everybody a compiler cannot understand what the code is doing, basically. Right? Um, but still, you know, for some patterns, if you turn on vectorization and the optimization report, uh, the compiler can at least do something for you. But at the same time, um, there are a gazillion, a gazillion of reasons why the auto vectorizer usually bails out and says, well, you know, I can't do anything for you, I, don't, I can't vectorize. The, the first and foremost are data dependencies, and we will come to that in a minute, why C, C++ are bad languages when it comes to data dependencies. But there's also other reasons, like, um, for instance, a good one is a function call in a loop block. Right? In those cases, if there's no vectorized version of that function, you cannot do vectorization anymore, or you need to scalarize the, the function calls or whatever. Um, sometimes, especially in, um, um, let's say, all to Fortran codes, you see those massive loops, like 100,000 lines in a single loop, right? And in those cases, of course, the compiler just says, yeah, I, you know, it's a bit complicated to understand what the code is doing. Um, I can't do anything for you anymore. Loop not countable, that's one of my favorites. Also, one of the C, C++ language deficits. Um, mixed data types. So sometimes if you mix single precision and double precision numbers, you can, you can pretty much confuse a compiler as well. Um, non-unit stride, loop body too complex, um, and, and sometimes the compiler just thinks that the, the vectorization will, will lead to less performance than, than, than the scalar code and it will bail out, okay? And then there are, you know, as I said, a gazillion of reasons, uh, some of which are really esoteric. Okay, let the C bashing begin. So, this is an example for loop not countable and assumed data dependencies. Do you see why? Let's make this interactive. For the video, can you put in like the Jeopardy theme while the audience is thinking? Size. 
Okay, yeah, maybe, yeah. Mm, yeah, for instance. Even worse. Even worse. Exactly, exactly. C pointers are, can point anywhere. Right? So you got two, two reasons why this is failing. So first of all, the compiler cannot be sure that the data pointers are not overlapping in the sense that, for instance, the C data pointer somehow overlaps with the A structure, right? Or the data in the A structure. And then the other thing is that as pointers in theory can point anywhere, you could create an example where size is actually overwritten by modifying the C data pointer. As I said, you know, C is a very beautiful language in that regard. You can shoot yourself, okay? And you usually do. And then there's C++ where you shoot yourself, but it takes the whole leg, basically, when you shoot your foot. Okay, and then of course there's, there's some stupidity in the memory model, or I should say the lack of memory model in, in C. So it needs to assume that if, if, if there's potentially multi-threading, that um, A size also changes. Okay, now let me tell you a tale of grief and sorrow. In a time before OpenMP4, there were solutions to these problems, right? Um, when you relied on auto vectorization, almost all the compilers gave you additional means um, to fix all those problems that I was describing, right? So, for instance, uh, you could use something like Intel Silk Plus. Uh, Hans was showing that with the array notations. Or there were some compiler pragmas, for instance, in our compiler it's pragma vector, um, to tell the compiler, no matter what you think about the code, please do the vectorization, right? And for those um, crazy folks um, that really wanted to program low level, they had intrinsics or even inline assembly or anything like that. Um, to make it happen, okay? All of these are not very productive. Usually they are not very portable, and sometimes they are really painful like low-level constructs, okay? So what you ended up with is something like this, all right? You wanted to write something like parallel four, and then you stick additional pragmas in there that say, you know, now vectorize always, all right, don't, don't uh, be tripped by, by data dependencies. Um, don't do any heuristics, just vectorize. Um, and then there's pragma IV dap um, to say, you know, if there's assumed data dependencies, also please ignore them. All right, now the fun thing is compiler pragmas um, ought to be um, compiler specific. But for instance, the Cray compiler also understands pragma IV dep and has slightly different semantics than the Intel compiler. So what you had was this massive amount of, if it's a Cray compiler, do this. If it's an Intel compiler, do this. If it's GCC, do that. And then you had like, you know, for your for a little three line loop, you had like 10 lines or 20 lines of compilation guards. The other thing that usually happens is, this is not a C program. Right? Because you're using vendor specific pragmas plus OpenMP. Right? At the same time, it is not an OpenMP program because you're using vendor specific extensions to the base language. Now, if the compiler doesn't do the right job for you, you're lost. Right? You submit a bug report with Intel and the OpenMP team says, well, you know, this is a vectorizer bug. And then the vectorizer team from the base language team says, well, this is an OpenMP bug. Right? And then this is, there's this finger pointing. And unless you really bought a big machine, there's no chance that this you know, finger pointing actually stops. And the OpenMP people are nice people, so we fixed that problem for you. Right? So we in, with OpenMP4, we invented the Cindy pragma. Right? We, we attempted to standardize all those compiler-specific Cindy pragmas into an OpenMP standard pragma that is portable functional portable across all the OpenMP implementations, okay? This is how it looks like for C and, and Fortran. So basically it's pragma omp simd and then the usual, usual clauses and I'm, I'm gonna explain the clauses in a minute. The same for, for do loops. It's important to understand that this is not parallelizing anything. 
It's just simplification, so vectorization of a loop. It, the loop itself will still run single-threaded. Okay, that's only a vectorization problem. Okay, here's an example. Um, and I, let, me, let me add a little disclaimer here. Um, since the size of a slide is rather limited, all the examples that I'm going to show in the next couple of minutes are usually examples where an auto vectorizer will do the right thing. Okay? So if your compiler doesn't vectorize that example, throw away your comp compiler and get another one. Okay? For instance, the Cray compiler or the Intel compiler. Okay? These, they, they should do that. Okay. Now let's add Pragma SIMD, reduction. You've seen that from OpenMP programs before. And what happens is the compiler now has the knowledge. There are no data dependencies. You can, you can relax the floating point ordering of the sum reduction variable. Um, you can create as many private copies of sum as you need for, for SIMD vectorization. You can do all that. And then at the end, you do a horizontal aggregation of the individual sums into a final scalar sum. That's it. Right? And now the compiler has everything that it needs um, to actually do its job on that, on, that, on that piece of code. And you don't need to use you know, some fancy compiler magic uh, to relax the floating point model or whatever. It's all contained in that program. Okay, data sharing clauses. This is now because I'm, a, um, I'm an OpenMP language lawyer. Um, so now we, we, we need to redefine all the data sharing clauses to not be defined in terms of threading, but in terms of, of SIMD vectorization. So what, what it means is if you have a private variable, you take the original variable, and instead of making private copies for each thread, you replicate this variable into a vector register. Right? So you create as many virtual variables as you have vector lanes in your, in your SIMD vector. Okay? First private. Basically, same thing. Now you take the original value and you create as many copies as you need and you initialize those copy by copies by broadcasting the initial value across the vector register. Okay? Uh, reduction, same thing as with threading, but now in terms of SIMD. So you got your SIMD lanes with values and then pr you produce a final outcome in a scalar variable um, according to the operator that you gave to the, to the clause. All right? Okay. Then there is safe LAN. Safe LAN means the maximum number of iterations that can run concurrently without breaking a dependence. I'm going to have an example in a minute if you don't, if you don't get that uh, immediately. And in practice, it's the maximum vector width that you can use for that particular loop. And I'll, I'll show you in a minute. Then there is linear. Um, so the idea of linear is that you got an original variable, you got your loop counter i, and then a linear step. And then you can express that a certain variable is an induction variable or a linear variable compared to the, to the loop variable. For instance, a pointer. Right? A pointer has a certain start value, and then for each iteration you know how many, t how many elements or how many bytes the pointer needs to advance. Right? And that's something you can express with the linear clause so that the compiler knows how to build any value of that pointer only from the, from the loop index. Yes, there's a question. Uh, I guess it's not necessary to just increment it. Yes. Yeah, so the question is, is this really computed or can the compiler increment it? The compiler can do whatever it likes. Right? It's just the information that if the loop counter ticks by that much, um, then the, other, the, the dependent variable takes that much, okay? And then it can, you know, fill a vector register with, with pre-populated values and increment the whole vector register or whatever it needs to do. It's just a inf piece of information for the compiler, right? And the compiler can then do whatever it feels necessary um, to implement that, okay? Okay, and then there's a little performance optimization that you could do. You can tell the compiler that a certain pointer is aligned with these alignment properties. So that's additional information for the compiler that it's probably more efficient um, to vectorize um, if, if, the, if certain alignment properties hold. Okay? And then there's also collapse, of course, where you can fuse loops and build product loops, and then you know, the compiler does the right thing uh, to deconstruct them again. Okay, 
Now, short, um, in, the, in the mezzo about um, loop carry dependencies, who's the compiler engineer in here? Uh-oh. I, I, when, when I do that, that slide, I'm always hoping that nobody raises their hands um, because I'm oversimplifying things right now, okay? So bear with me, okay? That's, um, you know, introduction to compiler 101, whatever. Um, okay, so dependencies usually mean that you have to th complete something before something else starts. That's a dependency, right? And data dependencies means that you have to write something to a variable like an updated value before you can read the variable the next time. And that kind of establish you, establishes you for you a, a program order in which you need to execute your program, right? And for instance, the out of order engine in the CPU tries to detect that at runtime and then figure out what is the ideal sequ sequence of instructions um, to be fed in the, into the machine, okay? Now that's data dependencies. A loop carry dependency is a data dependency that happens between two loop iterations. Which basically means that you have to complete the first iteration, the start of the data dependency, before you can execute the second iteration, the end of the data dependency, or the target, okay? Usually, when you have data dependencies, you can't parallelize the code anymore, right? So in this example, there's a data dependency, um, length 17, so we need to, you know, before we can write any A of I, we need to make sure that we read all the A plus 17 I's. Um, so there's a natural loop order now, okay? And now, now, it's the, the, now comes the oversimplification. A simple test, it's not a, a very good test, but it's, it's a first indication if you have a loop carry dependencies or not. If you reverse the loop and you get different results, you likely have a data dependency. If you don't, there's usually no, no data dependency. Okay, and this is now where the compiler, uh, compiler construction guys really jump at me. It's like, yeah, no, that's wrong. There are out of loop carry dependencies, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, no, it's, it's a simple test, okay? Um, okay, now the question is, can we parallelize the loop on the previous slide? Who says yes? Partially, okay. Who says no, you can't? Who says yes, you can parallelize it, but with very, very specific loop schedules? There you go, exactly. You can still parallelize it, but you know, it's not so easy just to write, you know, Pragma OpenMP parallel four and you're done. That doesn't work, that doesn't cut it. You need to, you know, do some very special loop schedules. What about vectorization? Can we vectorize the loop? Who says yes? Okay, who says no? Who says, what am I doing here? Okay. You can vectorize it, yes. And, you know, this is now not a product announcement by Intel. So let me, let me draw a picture with all the data dependencies. Um, and there's, again, a little bug on my slide, so this should be here. So this is how the depend data dependencies or loop carry dependencies look like in that, in that previous loop, okay? And now, no product announcement. Let's take a SIMD vector register with length seven. Just, you know, to be really confusing. So what happens is you, co you compute on the first seven iterations of your loop. The data dependency is way across the whole loop, right? And then you move your SIMD vector along the loop iterations. Again, we compute seven elements. We don't break any data dependencies, and by the time we would start breaking the data dependencies, we already computed all the sources of the data dependencies, okay? Whereas you can't parallelize it, you can safely vectorize the loop or simdify the loop, okay? Um, and that's where SafeLin comes in, right? SafeLin gives the information to the compiler, yes, dear compiler, it's always good to talk to your compiler like a dear friend, dear compiler, it's very helpful, it produces much better code when you do that. Um, um, so the safe lane now tells the compiler, dear compiler, yes, I know there is a data dependency, but the length of the data dependency is 17, so you can use up to 16 elements per register without breaking the data dependency. Okay, and then the compiler can figure out how to vectorize it, use four elements per vector registers, use a big vector of 16, 
do double bumping in terms of you know, fusing two vector registers to a virtual eight lane vector register, whatever it needs to do, unless it breaks the, the dependency. Okay, so that's additional context information for the compiler. Okay, and then there are SIMD work sharing constructs, Pragma, OpenMP, for SIMD, which take a for loop, or if it's a work sharing construct for, for Fortran, a do loop, they apply parallelization and vectorization at the same time. All right, makes sense. Okay, here's again my previous example. So let's add a pragma to it, pragma open MP for SIMD. So what happens is we take the loop nest, we parallelize it, and then once we parallelized it, we vectorize it. Okay, does anyone see a problem with that? You have to do it from without violating open MP semantics, but do you see a problem with that? Yep, yep. So what happens is, um, that because you do the chunkification for, for threads first, you cannot guarantee that all the th threads, uh, all the chunks are first aligned. And the other thing is that you cannot guarantee that, uh, that the chunk size is a multiple of the vector size. Is that what you meant? Yes, okay. So here's, here's an example. So this is actually a picture that's drawn wrong again. So here there's, three quarters of a vector registers alloc allocated to, the, to thread zero, and then this one is actually a scalar element that the, that the other thread has to compute first, okay? But as I said, from OpenMP perspective, this is the only sane way to do that. We try to specify it the other way around and help break loose, basically, okay, if you do that. Okay, now, be careful what you wish for. OpenMP is a programming model that also allows you to shoot yourself, okay? And this is how you can do that, if you're curious. Let's say, you know, I do for SIMD, and I want to specify a static schedule of size five. So that means um, the chunk size assigned to, the e to each of the threads is five. OpenMP will happily do that, right? It will not complain about it, but what you will get is for AVX2 and AVX512, the code will only execute remainder loops. There is no full SIMD vector register that would fit a chunk size of five, okay? So this is a great way to say open a piece SIMD and get scalar code basically, right? Um, if you do SSE, well, things are slightly different. You get at least one vector chunk and then uh, the remainder loops. But basically what it means is you need to be absolutely careful what you're asking for in terms of chunk size when you do the parallelization, right? And something like uh, schedule dynamic with chunk size one doesn't really blend well with uh, SIMD either. Okay, but we thought about you, right? We are, we are friendly people, as I said. So what we did is we now have so-called schedule modifiers. So you can now modify the schedule of a loop from static to be SIMD static. And this is now an information for the compiler, which basically says, dear compiler, again, you know, be nice to your compiler. Dear compiler, I think that a static schedule is good. And I do think that a chunk size of five is what I, wanna, what I would like to, to, to have. But please compiler, um, change the chunk size so that it matches your SIMD code generation. Okay, keep it close to five. That's what I think it's, it's good for my algorithm, but please adjust it so that it doesn't violate SIMD, SIMD properties. And this is exactly what the compiler does. Is basically, it, t it rounds it up so that, you know, it's slightly bigger than what you, ex what you, what you specified, but it is a multiple of the, of the SIMD chunk size. Okay, so for AVX 512, the new chunk size will be eight. For SSE, the new chunk size will be eight as well. Okay. And then the problem is gone. Okay. How about that example? I think Hans alluded to that yesterday as well. Will the compiler vectorize that? Who says yes? And let me let me let me probably do a, a, a small. Um, 
boundary condition, let's say float min and disk sq are not in the same compilation unit. So who says the compiler will vectorize that loop? Who says yes? Potentially, yes, well, okay. First of all, of course, is it, C? it is C, so the compiler will again bail out with data dependencies, right? So I have to do this, okay? I, that, that, that was mean, I'm sorry. Okay, does the compiler now vectorize everything? Hans already said yes within the procedural optimization. Well, chances are that the compiler would do the, two different things. First of all, it could just say, uh, you know, I don't have vectorized function bodies, I'm gonna bail out, okay? The other option that it does is, um, it could still vectorize the code, but then unpack a vector register to call four times, eight times, 16 times, I don't know how many times, whatever Cindy lanes I have in my system, um, individual scalar versions of disk SQ and then repack a vector register out of those scalar invocations and do the same for min, okay? The other thing I have to say here is there's something like the small, small vector math library. Hans was mentioning that yesterday. Um, so if, the, if you have a, a production quality compiler that is really aiming at vectorization, um, there's a good chance that it already supplies you with a vectorized min, max, you know, logarithms, exponentials, and whatnot functions, okay? But this SQ, that's now something that you wrote, right? And so the compiler will probably not have a vectorized version of that unless you specifically supply it with, you know, the, the tackle specs and attributes that, that Hans was uh, talking about yesterday. Now the solution is to allow for some, uh, for function vectorization, right? So with OpenMP, what you can do is you can Cindy declare a function. So you can add an OpenMP pragma to your function's definition and tell the compiler to vectorize the whole function, okay? Okay, let's do that. So what we do is we add pragma OpenMP declare simply to each of our functions. And what the compiler does is it takes the function body um, and now this is pseudocode. So vec8 is some vector register pseudo data type, it takes the function, the input arguments are now vectors. Instead of scalar variables, these are now vectors. The return value is changed to be a vector, and the function body now becomes vector statements. All right, so we take A, we vector compare it with B, we produce a mask register, and then you know, we pick and choose A and B, or elements from A and B, so that we get the minimum and maximum or the minimum in this case, out of, out of, the bo of both vectors, right? And for disk SQ, we basically do the same. So this is now an element-wise subtraction and an element-wise multiplication of X and Y and the result of it, okay? We still keep the scalar version, of course, right? Because if that is in a library, we don't know where you know, where, what, what the call side looks like. And so we at least keep the scalar version and we add, add, add addition, additional versions for, for, the, for the SIMD vectorization. Okay, and then at the call side, the compiler basically promotes these to be vectors, right? And then it calls the vectorized functions and um, everything is golden, okay? Yes, please. Would the code still be would the code still be portable across uh, different hardware? Uh, I mean, if I try to compile the same code on, uh, on hardware that does not have uh, SIMD capabilities? Uh, no, no, right? So you keep the scalar version, right? So that the compiler will do some additional magic, basically, mm -hmm. right? But that is the same thing as with vectorized loops as well, right? If you, if you vectorize a loop for, for KNL, AVX yeah. 512, this loop will not run on a Broadwell processor. And it's the same thing here, right? If you vectorize a function for, for KNL, um, you, will, you will only see um, you know, KNL executable code. One thing that we can do, though, is um, I didn't specifically tell you, but you can have multiple of those declare SIMD 
pragmas for a function, and for each of the pragmas, it will generate a new version. So you can basically have as many versions as you want, right? The only, you know, the downside is that you get some code bloat, right? But you can have a version for AVX2, you can have a version for AVX512, you can have multiple different versions where you have, you know, different calling sites and different properties, and I'll show you in a minute what the clauses do. Um, so you can, you, you know, you can create as many of them as you, as you need, right? And then the compiler at the call site will figure out um, which one to call, okay? Okay, talked about that. So SimDLAN, that's one of the, one of the things we, we should be talking about. Um, so this now tells the compiler to use a, a certain SIMD length, um, length of a SIMD vector register. So for instance, you could do eight, that would give you an AVX2 version, right? Or you could do 16, um, that would give you a KNL version of the function. Right? And, and the Intel compiler also has some vendor-specific additions where you can explicitly say, you know, this should be in a 16-element vector register for Skylake or for KNL or for whatever other processor, okay? Okay, then there's uniform, where you can list an argument that shouldn't be promoted to a vector register. So say you got a function that takes a vector and then wants to add a scalar to each of the vector elements. Right? And in this case, in these cases, you can say, you know, the, the scalar should be uniform, which means that the compiler can, you know, do whatever it needs, so promote it to a vector register or whatever. It's okay. All right. Okay, in branch, not in branch, I have an example for that. I'm not going to explain it here. Um, and then there's linear aligned reduction with the regular meanings. Okay? So here's an example for in branch and not in branch. Okay, say we got a loop where the call side of a function is contained in one of the branches of an if statement. What the compiler has to do is um, basically evaluate this if condition and then somehow tell this function what the outcome of the if was. Right? And within branch, you can tell the compiler generate a version of this do stuff function that is only callable from within such a context. Okay? And not in branch basically tells the compiler to avoid all the overhead that is associated with this additional argument passing because you know and you ensure for the compiler that this function is never called from the wrong context. Okay? So within, a, within this statement. And this is how it looks like. And it kind of boils down to what I was saying yesterday about KNL architecture. A mask register is something that costs you, right? It's not a lot, but it's still, you know, it's visible. And so what it usually does, does is if you add in branch to it, there will be a, a, an implicit argument with a mask register. And then all the instructions inside the do stuff vector version will use that mask register um, to only compute where the, where the mask is set to true. All right? So basically this is now moving, let me build up the slide completely. Um, so when we do a vector compare here, we get this mask register. So this is the way the compiler moves the result of the if statement into the function body for you. All right? And as this costs some, some cycles on, on a KNL, um, you can tell the compiler that this is not necessary. Or that it's always necessary. Okay, um, now in terms of performance, um, it actually pays off, right? So um, dark blue is the performance of the Intel compiler auto vectorizer, normalized to one, and the yellow, um, yellow, stupid me, light blue. That's now the performance with Cindy Pragmas added to it, OpenMP Cindy Pragmas. Okay, and as you can see, um, there's some meat to it, right? That it's not that um, you know some crazy folks thought this is something that we want to have in OpenMP. This is the reason why we really want that in OpenMP, right? And if you look at those guys, um, so let me start with Black Skulls. Typical risk analysis thing from FSI Financial Services. Um, it's just arrays, plain arrays that, that are number crunched, right? The compiler can actually vectorize it 
easily. It's not a big deal for the compiler. The only reason why it didn't vectorize is assumed data dependencies because the compiler didn't figure out um, if there's aliasing or not between the arrays that, that, uh, that we are computing on, right? So F no alias would do the trick, right? And you would get the blue bar, the, the light blue bar, also with the auto vectorizer, right? But you know, if you, if you compile an unknown code with F no alias, the code is not gonna run correctly, right? And for you, it's also really hard to ensure that, you know, a global effect like F no alias um, that has an effect on all the compiled source code is still correct or not, right? So it's better to use something, you know, in there. You could do the same thing with the restrict keyword of, uh, I think, C99. Why, don't, why didn't we use that one? Well, it's a C++ code, and C++ doesn't have that restrict keyword. Eh. Stupid C++. Let me bash them. Um, SGBB, that's a data mining application. Problem here is that the compiler didn't figure out that there are min and max and that there are nonlinear kernels. Still, they are easy to vectorize, but the compiler just didn't recognize the pattern behind them. Right? So the compiler didn't do anything. Mandelbrot, kind of a very nice Hello World program for performance analysis. Um, it didn't vectorize. Why didn't it vectorize? Well, there's a Y loop in there that basically takes the X, Y coordinates of a pixel, treats them as uh, a complex number, and then sees if a series of computations converge or diverge, right? And a Y loop is per se not countable. Right? But what you can do with Mandelbrot is, since um, the while loop is within a function body, you can vectorize the while loop not you know, um, as a while loop itself, but you can vectorize multiple instances of, those, of this while loop. Right? And that gives this nice speed up um, for that one. All right. Questions? Yes, please. What kind of improvement can you um, hope for when you have a low arithmetic intensity with vectorization? Um, something between none and a little bit. Um, and you know, it's, it's always kind of a fussy answer. I'm sorry about that. Um, but you know, the, the, the thing about, about vectorizing a memory bandwidth bound code is unless um, you get really different memory streaming behavior. It doesn't really make a difference if you have, like, you know, four load instructions or if you load four elements in one, one, one instruction, right? So that's why you don't see that, that high performance boost. What you do see, though, is, um, at least on Intel architecture, um, streaming stores, so non-temporal stores, where the cache is by bypassed, um, can only be used for vectorized instructions, right? So there's no non-temporal scalar load or store. Um, so in, this ca in these cases, vectoriz vectorization can give you a little bit of benefit, right? But in general, if you're really maxing out the memory bandwidth, vectorization will not, you know, really boost performance like, you know, factor of three. It's more gradual improvements that you will see, right? Okay, now there's a second topic I was supposed to talk about, and that's open MP affinity. Um, and I hope to have that finished by 12. Actually, I will have it, have it finished by 12. I don't wanna you know, talk to a hungry, grou a grouchy crowd. Um, okay, so why is uh, memory af or affinity important? Well, you know, this, this slide deck basically was created when KNL was still to be born. Okay, so one of the reasons is this, right? So NUMA is here and NUMA is going to stay. If you look at what, what architectures are built today, most of them are NUMA systems, either dual socket, um, four socket or eight socket systems, or in case of KNL, you have like, you know, the sub NUMA cluster mode where we artificially partition the system into NUMA domains. Okay, so they, they are here and they're gonna stay. Now, the question is, why does it matter? 
Well, it's memory performance. So what I'm comparing here is uh, four experiments, compact par, which means that the threads are compactly packed on a system, and data um, has been data allocation has been parallelized. Um, scatter par, we distribute the threads across the whole system, right, and we parallelize um, the data allocation. And then the same thing for sequential data allocation. And as you can see, if I put, sc scatter my memory across the NUMA domains, but then only run on a single socket, I'm getting like, you know, interestingly low memory bandwidth, right? If I do the memory allocation wrong, right? I put every, all my memory into a single NUMA domain and then run on the full system, I'm also getting kind of so-so performance, right? But only if I, if I do um, the computation in a way that matches the parallelization of, or the, the, the data allocation, then I get optimal performance out of the system, okay? Now, with a little bit of focus more on the Xeon Phi, you've seen that picture a couple of times already. So let me zoom in. So what you'll see is, again, you know, yellow tiles. Each tile is a dual core, and each of the cores has those four hyper threads or hardware threads, right? And then the question is, how do you program for that? And one, one way you could do that or think about it is this, right? So you could think about, about, about an outer parallel region with 34 threads, or 32 in your case, because you've got a 64 core machine. So we do one thread per tile, right, on the outer level, and then we do eight threads, one for each hardware thread per tile. Okay, so we have this two-level parallelism. And you can easily extend that to MPI, where you run a couple of MPI ranks across the NUMA domains, and then one, MPI, uh, one open MP thread per tile, and then again, a couple of open MP threads per, per core or per hardware thread, okay? And now the question is, how do you tell the runtime system to not put your 34 threads all in this upper left corner and stick it there, because there are certainly more than 34 hyper threads only in the up, upper left corner, right? And the other question is, how do you do that in, in a way so that you don't have to cope with Cray's OpenMP implementation and Intel's OpenMP implementation? All right, for us, it's KMP something. For Cray, I don't even know what the environment variables would be. And of course, there's also MPI with IMPI, pin domain, blah, 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 and then there's the, the Cray equivalent, okay? So these are the questions. Now, what you can get out of it, and I put a may here. It's kind of my leeway of, you know, getting through the door without bloody noses. Um, so if you put threads far apart, right, um, what you will get is a better aggregated memory bandwidth. I was showing a picture like that, right? You will improve the combined cache size, right? If you think about 34 tiles, that's way more cache than a single tile, right? Um, but at the same time, if the threads are talking a lot through logs or whatever shared variables, you increase the, decrease the performance of synchronization construct. And I put the may because there are always corner cases where this doesn't happen, okay? Now, if you put everything close together, you improve the, the situation in terms of synchronization and talking to each other in, in between your threads. But what you will also see is that you likely decrease the available memory bandwidth or the available cache per thread. Okay? Anyways, what you can do is in OpenMP4, and we slightly extended that in OpenMP4.5, so OpenMP4 introduced a couple of concepts. First of all, there are places. And that is um, a set of threads running on some processor. So basically, we don't, we don't explicitly say processors in the specification, as far as I know, but it's just an entity that can execute an OpenMP thread. That's what we call a place, right? And it's a set of, 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 of those entities. Um, and we have a couple of, of predefined places available. It's kind of, you know, when you look out at what the industry does today, we have threads, we have cores, and we have sockets, all right? So we predefine those, those names so that you can just say, I want eight cores, 
right? And then the, the implementation for KNL knows the notion of what a core is for, for KNL, or an ARM compiler would know the notion of what a, what a core is on an ARM processor, okay? Then we define affinity policies. So now we tell the runtime system how the OpenMP threads should be placed with respect to the available places for the program. Okay? So what we have is spread. So, you know, we have a, cer a certain set of places, and it's like Germans going to a restaurant. Right? If a German, and I may make the joke because I'm German, if I go to a restaurant, I look around and I'll take a free table where that is as far apart as possible from the other occupied tables. That's how Germans behave, right? <laughs> yeah, but I'm not, I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm not going to, and please bleep that joke from, from the video. Um, okay, close. I don't know which, which, which people do that, but basically close means you go to a restaurant, you pick a table where already somebody's sitting, right? And then master, okay, I'm not gonna do, talk about that, but basically it means you co-locate with your master thread. And I'm, you know, I'm not gonna go down this, the road of master slave now. Um, and then what we also define is uh, certain means to define and control these settings. Okay, probably I should do the code of conduct training at Intel again. Um, okay, so there's environment variables that have a standard syntax across implementations, and you could even think about a queuing system like Slurm or Moab or whatever that already populates those, those things for you depending on what you, what you ask as resources for. Okay, so on places now is an environment variable that contains all the places, and there's on proc bind, which basically takes those policies and maps the open MP threads to the corresponding place lists. Okay, and we also invented a clause so that you can have more fine grained control on a per region level um, of how you want to assign those threads to, to places. Okay, and if, we, if I repeat the example from from, the, from a couple of slides ago. So let's say I have a KNL system. I want to run on eight cores. So say I have something like, you know, um, I don't know, eight MPI ranks running on my system, right? So I want to run on eight cores per MPI rank. Um, what I can do is then say omp places is eight cores, whatever cores now mean, um, and num threads now takes a list of how many threads I want per, per nesting level. So in this case, I want four by four. And then when I do omp parallel, the master thread is somewhere. Um, now I do a proc bind spread and what will happen uh, is that for the first level, OpenMP will assign the master thread to some processor. The other threads will be assigned to the other processors, they will spread out across those eight cores that I was asking for. And then for the next level, when I do something like proc bind close, I can now say, you know, now pack those threads as closely as possible in, but evenly distribute them in one of your sub places uh, for one of your master OpenMP threads or for, for your other OpenMP threads. All right? Yes, please. I have a question. So, sure. if you have multiple pragma when parallel, when p parallel, and mm -hmm. you have different placement for those different loops, how do you do it if you have only one variables, only one variables when p places? Okay. So the there there are two two answers to that question. The first part is the omp places like course eight. That's something that comes from the outside. Right, so that is um, how many cores you got from your batch system, or how many cores are available because of the injected MPI pinning from the top, right? Um, so this is something that you can't change at runtime, right? This is something that is injected from, from the running environment you're, you're, or the, the boundary conditions that you're running on, okay? Now, um, for the, for the um, affinity setting, of how to assign OpenMP threads to those places that you listed from the outside, there are two ways, right? So there's the environment variable, which basically says, this is the setting I wanna use, and this is now for all the parallel regions, 
And again, this is a list so that you can have, you know, outer level of a parallelization is this, and then next level, and next level, and next level. Or you can control that on a per region basis using those pragmas, right? If you don't care about, or if you want to use the same affinity setting for all your parallel regions, the environment variable is good enough. But if you want to change it on a per region basis, um, you can do it with OpenMP parallel proc bind. Or the other thing that you could do is you can have the environment variable set to something and then override it for just a single parallel region by using the clause. All right, so you can flexibly combine that um, to assign, uh, to assign the, the threads to cores. Now, there's one thing I need to tell you, though. Um, this comes at a price, right? And it's amazingly costly to tell the operating system to change the affinity of a thread. Okay, so be aware that you shouldn't do that for a parallel region that just executes like 10 uh, instructions on the machine because then the affinitization will be more costly than uh, whatever you're doing, right? Um, but it, it, it actually pays off for, you know, if it's, if it's large parallel um, regions. Yes, please. Okay, this is maybe a stupid question, but I, on the last row, I would expect the four threads to be only on P0. Um, yes, that is, that is a speciality in the, in the OpenMP specification, and I think I listed it on the slides, um, where I, I actually missed the words evenly here, right? Um, so it, it tries to always do an evil, not an evil, an equal, <laughs> OpenMP is not an evil programming model. Sometimes it can be. Um, it, it tries to equalize the threads across the machine, of course. Right? So we don't, we don't want to overload them. Balance. Yeah, it's, it's in, Intel, Intel, MPR, Intel OpenMP would call it balanced. Right? And, and dear Intel friends um, watching the video and, and in, in this room, um, you know, I'm not showing the KMP versions of those. Right? I really want people to use the OpenMP way of expressing affinity because that's the portable way. Right? And you should only use the KMP equivalents if you're absolutely sure what you're doing. You can shoot yourself um, many more, in many more ways than you can do, can you, uh, you can do here. And the other thing is, um, usually this is good enough for like 90% of the users. And there's only a few users that need some extra control over what is going on, and that's when you use KMP affinity, right? Okay, that's it. And I think we have five seconds left for no questions. All right, thank you guys. <laughs>